So uh, with that, it's a pleasure to welcome today um, Sarah Reitzes from the University of Chicago, who will talk to us about reduction games, provability, and compactness. All right. Um, hi. So yeah, as Demir said, I'm going to talk about reduction games, provability, and compactness. Um, I'm Sarah, and this is joint work with Demir and Dennis Hirschfeld. Um, and I'll discuss a main result um, about like a compactness result for reduction games. But to start, we need some background in reverse math. Um, so uh, in reverse math, we often look at pi one two problems. And a pi one two problem is a sentence of the form for all x, theta of x implies there exists a y such that psi of x, y holds. Um, and this is a sentence of second order arithmetic where theta and psi are arithmetic. And we say that a subset x of omega such that theta of x holds is an instance of this problem. And a solution is a subset y of omega such that psi of x, y holds. And we typically denote these problems by P and Q. Now, second order arithmetic is a two sorted first order language. This will actually be crucial in our main result. So this is an important fact to remember. Um, we have number objects and we have set objects. And we typically work in the base system RCA naught. Some of you may have seen the formal definition of RCA naught, but I'm just gonna define it informally. That's all we need for our purposes. And so for our purposes, we can think of RCA naught roughly as computable mathematics. So all the sets that exist in RCA naught are just the computable sets. And we'll also consider the system ACA naught which corresponds to the Turing jump existence problem for all x, there exists a y such that y is the jump of x. And we have this really nice theorem from folklore proved by Wang that if ACA naught proves for all x, theta of x implies there exists a y such that delta of x, y holds, where theta and delta are arithmetic, then there is an n and omega that's independent of the instance x of theta such that if for all, um, ACA naught proves for all x, if theta of x holds, then there is a y that is sigma zero n in x, such that delta of x, y holds. And the power in this theorem is the fact that the n is independent of the instance x of theta. And our main result will actually be a similar, similar to this, but in the setting of reduction games. So when we talk about models of second order arithmetic, we mean, um, the, a model of second order arithmetic has a first order part n and a second order part s, which is a subset of two to the n. And if n is standard, we say that m is an omega model and we identify it with its second order part. We have this really nice characterization that an omega model satisfies RCA naught if and only if it is a Turing ideal, meaning it's closed under Turing reducibility and finite joins. Likewise, we have a really nice characterization for when an omega model satisfies ACA naught, which is if and only if it is a jump ideal, meaning it's closed under the Turing jump. Um, and in addition to omega models, we have a notion of omega reducibility, where we say that P is omega reducible to Q and write it as shown if every omega model of RCA naught plus Q is also a model of P. And so if RCA naught plus Q implies P, then P is omega reducible to Q, but not necessarily vice versa, as we'll see soon in some examples. In addition to the notion of omega reducibility, we'll also look at several other notions of reducibility. One is computably, computable reducibility, where we say that P is computably reducible to Q and write it as shown. If whenever X is an instance of P, there is an x computable instance x hat of q such that whenever y hat is a solution to x hat, x has an x plus y hat computable solution. And we also have strong computable reducibility where we have the stronger requirement that x needs to be not just not x plus y hat computable, but just y hat computable. And then we'll also look at y rock reducibility, which is really the uniform version of computable reducibility, where instead of x hat being x computable, we require that x hat 
is computable from x by a functional theta, uh, phi. And likewise, instead of uh, a solution to x being x plus y hat computable from a solution to y from a solution to x hat, we require that it be there be a functional. And as with computable reducibility, um, if we drop the y hat from the uh, if we drop the y hat in the uh, when we compute a solution to x, then we uh, get strong y rock reducibility. So um, I'm going to give some definitions now that we need to define some examples of pi one two problems and see how these different reducibilities and notions of comparing problems work in action. So we write in brackets x to the n for the collection of n element subsets of x. And a k coloring of x to the n is a map from x to the n to k. We say that a coloring of x squared is stable if the limit for y and x of the color of xy exists for all x and x. We say that a subset h of x is homogeneous for a coloring c if there exists an i such that the color of s is equal to i for all n tuples s from h. And a subset l of x is limit homogeneous for c where C is a K coloring of pairs, if there exists an I such that the limit for Y and L of the color of XY equals I for all X and L. So these definitions give rise to the following pi one two problems. We have Ramsey's theorem for N tuples in K colors, RT and K, which says that every K coloring of N to the N has an infinite homogeneous set. We have Ramsey's theorem for N tuples, which we call RTN to the less than infinity, which just says for all K, Ramsey's theorem for N tuples and K colors holds. We also have the full Ramsey's theorem, which we write as RT, which says that for all K and all N, Ramsey's theorem for N tuples and K colors hold. We have stable Ramsey's theorem for K colorings of pairs, SRT2K, which says that every stable K coloring of N squared has an infinite homogeneous set. And we have D2K, which says that every stable K coloring of N squared has an infinite limit homogeneous set. So we have this really nice theorem from Jockish that says that for N greater than or equal to two, every computable instance of RTN to the less than infinity has a pi zero N solution. There exists a computable instance of RTN2 with no sigma zero two solution. And there exists a computable instance of RTN2 such that every solution computes zero to the n minus two. This theorem is really powerful because from the theorem, we have the following corollary proved by Simpson, which says that RTNK and RTN to the less than infinity are equivalent to ACA naught for n greater than or equal to three. So the way we get the corollary from the theorem is we first use the two easy implications, uh, which can easily be seen in terms of Turing reducibility, for instance, that RTN plus 1K implies RTNK, and RTNK plus 1 implies RTNK for all N and K. And then from the fact that every computable instance of RTN to the less than infinity has a pi zero N solution, we get that RTN to the less than infinity, and therefore RTNK, is provable in ACA naught for n greater than or equal to two. And then from the fact that there is a computable instance of RTN two such that every solution computes zero to the n minus two, which is non-trivial for n greater than or equal to three, we get that RTN k um, and from the implications I mentioned before, like for all n greater than or equal to three um, and all k um, proves ACA naught and then the um the work the work here is going from Turing reducibility to provability in RCA naught. Um, and so Cedapin showed that ACA naught is not omega reducible to RT2 to the less than infinity. So this kind of gives an indication of where the difference lies between RTN to the less than infinity for n greater than or equal to three and RT2 to the less than infinity. Um, RT2 to the less than infinity is omega reducible to RT2 too. However, Cholak, Jokish, and Slayman showed that over RCA naught, RT2 too does not imply RT2 to the less than infinity. 
So this is an indication, this is an example where we have provability or we have omega reducibility, but not provability over RCA naught. And so we also have that RCA naught proves RT1K for each K. So RT1 to the less than infinity is true in every omega model of RCA naught. However, Hirsch showed that RCA naught does not prove RT1 to the less than infinity. So this is again an instance where we have truth in every omega model of RCA naught, but not an RCA naught overall, which leads you to think that the problem, so to speak, might lie with non-standard cases, since that's the difference between being true in omega models and being true in general models of RCA naught. And so recall the theorem from folklore and Wang that said that if ACA naught proves a pi one two principle, then there is an N such that ACA naught proves that there is a solution that is sigma zero N in X regardless of what the, and the N is independent of the instance X. So from this, we get the corollary that the full Ramsey's theorem is omega reducible to ACA naught, but ACA naught does not prove Ramsey's theorem because if ACA naught proved Ramsey's theorem by the theorem from folklore and Wang, we would have that ACA naught would prove that there was a solution in sigma zero n for a particular n for every instance of Ramsey's theorem. And this would contradict the theorem from Jockish. Equivalently, we have that Ramsey's theorem is omega reducible to Ramsey's RT32, but over RCA naught, RT32 does not imply RT. So this is again an example of where we have omega reducibility but not provability in RCA naught. Now, going back to the theorem from Jockish, which said that every computable instance of RTN to the less than infinity has a pi zero n solution. There is a computable instance of RTN2 with no sigma zero two solution. And there is a computable instance of RTN2 such that every solution computes zero to the n minus two. We can also use this theorem to look at the versions of Ramsey's theorem in terms of computable and Wyrock reducibility. So we have the following results. Um, RTNK is strictly computably reducible to RTN plus 1K, and RTNK is strictly Wyrock reducible to RTN plus 1K for all N greater than or equal to one. We have a theorem proved by three different groups of researchers that RTNK is strictly omega reducible to RTNK plus one for all N greater than or equal to one, and k greater than or equal to two. And we have a theorem by Pate that RTNK is strictly computably reducible to RTNK plus one for all n and k greater than or equal to two. It's important to note that all of these reducibility, all of these reductions are strict because um, this completely characterizes all the principles RTNK in terms of computable and Wyrock reducibility and shows that they're all distinct which is pretty interesting um, as compared to our results over RCA naught. And so these three reducibilities are helpful, um, omega reducibility, computable reducibility, and Wyrock reducibility. And they allow us to use one instance of Q to solve an instance of P. But we have to consider the case where we might want to use multiple instances of Q to solve an instance of P. And an example of when this might happen is suppose we are trying to solve RT42 using RT22. We can do it. We can take a four coloring and group each, uh, group them in, group the colors into pairs, then apply RT22 to find a homogeneous set for this grouped coloring, then apply RT22 again to the homogeneous set to find a homogeneous set for the original coloring. And so we get a solution to RT42, but we have to use RT22 twice. So to, to like develop machinery to, and language to talk about cases like these, Hirschfeld and Jockfish introduced the idea of a reduction game. We consider two player reduction games for principles P and Q with the following general structure. So first player one plays an instance X zero of P then player two tries to obtain a solution to X zero by asking player one to solve various instances of Q. If player two ever plays a solution to X zero, they win and the game ends. 
but if the game never ends, then player one wins. And if a player is unable to make a move, then their opponent wins. So the way this game works is player one plays this instance of P and player two is trying to solve the instance of P by asking player one to solve instances of Q and trying to get as much information from those as possible. Meanwhile, player one's strategy is to give P player two as little, as little information as possible when it solves these instances of Q so that the game never ends or player two can't make a move, in which case player one wins. So the first reduction game we'll look at is the reduction game of Q implies P, which we define as follows. So on the first move, player one plays an instance X zero of P. Player two then either plays an X zero computable solution to X zero and wins, or plays an X zero computable instance Y one of Q. So note that if player two wins on the first move, this is just a computable reduction. So in a sense, we can think of this reduction game as a generalization of the idea of a computable reduction. Then for n greater than one on the nth move, player one plays a solution xn minus one to the instance yn minus one of q. And player two then either plays a, a solution to x zero that is computable in all of player one's previous moves or an instance of q that is computable in all of player one's previous moves. Hirschfeld and Jockish showed that if P is omega reducible to Q, then player two has a winning strategy for the reduction game of Q implies P, and otherwise player one has a winning strategy for the reduction game of Q implies P. This leads us to develop the following uh, new notion of reducibility, generalized y rock reducibility, where we say that P is generalized y rock reducible to Q, and we write it as shown if player two has a computable winning strategy for the reduction game of Q implies P. So based on the example that I gave earlier, it follows that RTN to the less than infinity is generalized y rock reducible to RTN2, and the full Ramsey's theorem is generalized y rock reducible to RT3 too. If player two has a winning strategy for the reduction game of Q implies P, and at most n plus one many moves, then we write P is omega reducible to Q with a superscript of N, and likewise for generalized y rock reducibility. So how do the problems that we were looking at before compare in terms of these, this new machinery? So we have a theorem from Hirschfeld and Jockish that for N greater than or equal to three, J greater than or equal to one, and M such that M lies between N plus the J minus first and J multiples of N minus two, then RTMK is generalized Y rock reducible and at most J plus two moves to RTNK, but RTMK is not omega reducible and at most J plus one moves to RTNK. And so since being generalized Y rock reducible and at most J plus two moves implies being omega reducible and at most J plus two moves, this means that RTMK is omega reducible and at most J plus two moves to RTNK, but not in at most J plus one moves. So the J plus second move is necessary. And therefore the full Ramsey's theorem is not omega reducible in at most J plus one moves to RT32 for all J, although it is omega reducible to RT32 overall. So this shows how this idea of being omega reducible in a certain, in at most a certain number of of moves is not always does not always hold that there are cases where we have omega reducibility but not omega reducibility bounded by a certain number of moves. Hirschfeld and Jockish also showed that for j greater than or equal to 2 and k lying between j to the m and j to the m plus 1 that rt1k is generalized y rock reducible and at most m plus 2 moves to rt1j but RT1K is not generalized Y rock reducible and at most M plus one moves to RT1J. So again, that M plus second move is necessary. Therefore, RT1 to the less than infinity is not generalized Y rock reducible and at most M plus one moves to RT1J for all M. Although RT1 to the less than infinity is generalized Y rock reducible to RT1J. And so this is especially interesting because here we have a generalized y rock reduction uh, between RT1 to the less than infinity and RT1j. So we have this uniform 
uh, this computable strategy for winning the game, but even, the, even still, we don't have this uniform number of moves that we can bound it in. Pate showed that for n greater than or equal to three, the RTNK are omega reducible and at most three moves to RTNJ for j less than k, but again, not omega reducible and at most two moves. So the uh, reduction in at most three moves is the best we can do. But for n equals two, the least m such that RTNK is omega reducible and at most m plus one moves to RTNJ approaches infinity as k increases. So as k increases, we are unable to bound the number of moves necessary. So we wanted to um, extend the notion of, we wanted to prove a, a result for an extended notion of reduction games. And in order to do this, uh, Hirschfeld and Jockish originally extended pi one, the definition of pi one two problems. And so in our definition of pi one two problems, we required that instances and solutions be subsets of omega, but we can extend this notion more generally by letting M be an L1 structure, meaning a model of first order arithmetic with domain M. And for a subset S of the domain, we write MS for the L2 structure, meaning the model of second order arithmetic with first order part M and second order part S. And for an L1 structure M, an M instance of P is a subset X of the domain such that M um, and S where S is just the set X models theta of X and a solution to X is a subset Y of M such that M S where S is just the set X Y models Psi of X Y. Um, one last little bit of notation is for N a uh, model of first order arithmetic and X zero through X N elements of the domain. We write N of X zero through X N to mean ns, where s consists of all subsets of the domain that are delta 0, 1 definable from parameters coming from the domain together with x0 through xn. And so with this extended notion of pi 1, 2 problems, we can define the gamma reduction game of q implies p, where gamma is a set of L2 formulas and p and q are again pi 1, 2 problems. We define the gamma reduction game of Q implies P as follows. So on the first move, player one plays a countable L1 structure M and an M instance X0 of P such that M of X0 is consistent with gamma. So as compared to the, uh, just the standard reduction game of Q implies P, instead of just playing an instance of P, player one now plays a first, a model of first order arithmetic, or yeah, a first order structure in addition to an instance of P and such that M of X zero, this augmented model is consistent with gamma. Player two then either plays the solution to X0, M of X zero and wins or plays an M instance Y one of Q and M of X zero. So now player two's moves have to lie in M of X zero. And then for N greater than one on the nth move, player one plays the solution XN minus one the instance y n minus one of q such that m of x zero through x n minus one is consistent with gamma and player two then either plays a solution to x zero in m of x zero through x n minus one and wins or plays an m instance y n of q and m of x zero through x n minus one so instead of player two's moves required to be computable in all of player one's previous moves we're now requiring that player two's moves lie in this model M of all of player one's previous moves. So we, um, to prove our result, we, it turns out we need to modify this game a little bit, which you'll see why we need that later. Um, but so for gamma, a set of L2 formulas and P and Q again, pi one, two problems, we also define the, we define the modified gamma reduction game of Q implies P as follows. So now on the first move, player one plays a model MS of gamma with M countable and an instance, an M instance X zero of P and S. So now instead of playing a first order structure 
player one now plays a second order structure in addition to the P instance X zero. And now the P instance X zero has to lie in the second part of this second order part of this model. Player two then either plays a solution to X zero and M of X zero and wins or plays an M instance Y one of Q and M of X zero. For n greater than one on the nth move, player one plays the solution xn minus one to the instance yn minus one of q and f. And player two then either plays the solution to x zero in m of x zero through xn minus one and wins, or plays an m instance yn of q in m of x zero through xn minus one. So as compared with the unmodified game, player two's moves are the same but player one now has to play its moves in the second order part of this model that it plays in its first move. Okay. And so uh, by extending a result from Hirschfeld and Jockish, we got that for gamma, a consistent extension of Delta zero one comprehension by Pi one one formulas and P and Q Pi one two problems. If gamma proves that Q implies P, then player two has a winning strategy for the gamma reduction game of Q implies P. And otherwise player one has a winning strategy for the modified gamma plus Q reduction game of Q implies P. For our main result, we also need the mild extra assumption that gamma proves the existence of a universal sigma zero one formula. So the main result says that if gamma satisfies the aforementioned conditions and P and Q are pi one two problems and gamma proves Q implies P, then there is an N such that player two has a winning strategy for the modified gamma reduction game of Q implies P that ensures victory in at most N many moves. And otherwise player one has a winning strategy for the modified gamma plus Q reduction game of Q implies P. So some things to note here, First of all, the last sentence of the theorem comes directly from the result on the previous slide. Um, and then it's easy to see how this is a version of the, or this is similar to the theorem from folklore in Wang, um, but in the context of reduction games. And so we don't know if this holds for the unmodified game or not. This is why we needed to define the modified game. But we do know that it's the strongest possible result because player two winning over gamma implies that player two, or player two having a winning strategy over gamma implies that player two would have a winning strategy over gamma plus Q. And player one having a winning strategy over gamma plus Q implies player one having a winning strategy over gamma. And these just come from the definitions of the games. I'm not going to go through the whole proof of this theorem, but I will talk about the gist of it. But first, I wanted to discuss some applications. So as a corollary, we have that if gamma is equal to RCA naught plus all pi one one formulas true over omega, and P is not omega reducible to Q and at most N plus one moves for all N, then gamma does not prove Q implies P. And the way we get this is that if gamma proved Q implies P, then by the theorem, we would have that there was an N such that player two had a winning strategy for the modified gamma reduction game over Q implies P. And because here we're taking gamma to be RCA naught plus all pi one one formulas true over omega, this would imply that for whatever N we get from the theorem, we would have P omega reducible in at most n moves to q. Um, so how does this work in terms of actual principles? We have the following example. So if q is rt22 and p is rt2 to the less than infinity, Pate showed that rt2 to the less than infinity is not omega reducible in at most n plus one moves to rt2k for all n and k. So therefore, gamma does not imply that RT22, or gamma does not prove that RT22 implies RT2 to the less than infinity. So this is pretty cool because this result was already known for gamma equals RCA naught, but now 
from our theorem, we can show that it's true for gamma equals RCA naught plus all pi one one formulas true over omega, which is a much stronger system. Okay, so as far as the proof of this theorem goes, it comes down to this essential lemma, which looks intimidating, but it basically says for n and omega, we have this formula theta n, which takes parameters e0 through en, x0 through xn, and y0 through yn. And so the xi's are just player one's moves. The yi's are player two's moves. And the ei's are just indices for player two's moves as computable functions um, with Oracle access to player one's previous moves. And so the formula just says, these moves constitute a winning strategy for player two. And we have, the lemma says that if gamma proves Q implies P, then there exists an N such that for all X zero, so for all first moves of player one, there exists an E zero and Y zero. So there exists a first move for player two, such that for all X one, so for all second moves for player one, there exists a second move for player two for, and so on up through n. So this essentially like codifies our main result into a formula. So it says um, this formula theta n holds where n corresponds to the n from the theorem that um, is the maximum number of moves we need to win. And so the way we play, we prove this lemma going back to something I said at the beginning of this talk is by a compactness argument because we have that second order arithmetic is um, a first order logic. And so we can apply compactness from first order logic and we, um, it's easy to see, or it's not too difficult to see that any finitely many of these sentences theta n are true. So therefore we can apply the compactness argument and get the conclusion of this lemma. And this is essentially the main like part of the proof of the theorem, the rest. Um, yeah, so this is the key ingredient. So since we generalize the notion of reduction games, it follows to generalize the notion of y rock reducibility um, to, or of generalized y rock reducibility um, to the idea of generalized y rock reducibility over gamma. We write P is generalized y rock reducible to Q over gamma with like a superscript gamma to mean that player two has a computable, meaning delta zero one winning strategy for the gamma reduction game of Q implies P. Likewise, we can define computable reducibility over gamma and y rock reducibility over gamma in a similar way. So this allows us to rewrite our main result as if P is generalized y rock reducible over gamma to Q, then there is an N in omega such that player two has a winning strategy for the gamma reduction game of Q implies P that ensures victory in at most N many moves. So again, it's, we have all this machinery and how does it work in context? So I'm gonna discuss the example of limit homogeneous sets. So recall that a coloring of x squared is stable if the limit for y and x of the color of xy exists for all x and x, and a subset L of x is limit homogeneous for a, two col for a k coloring of pairs if there exists an i such that the limit for y and L of the color of xy equals i for all x and L. And so these uh, definitions give us the principles SRT2K, which says that every stable K coloring of N squared has an infinite homogeneous set, and D2K, which says that every stable K coloring of N squared has an infinite limit homogeneous set. And so Cholak, Jokish, and Slayman showed that SRT22 is computably equivalent to D22. And Chong, Lemp, and Yang showed that SRT22 and D22 are equivalent over RCA naught. However, Jaforov showed that SRT22 is not Y rock reducible to D22, 
but Hirschfeld and Jockish show that SRT22 is generalized wire rock reducible and at most three moves to D22. So this is an example of how generalized wire rock reducibility can be used to differentiate between, um, and wire rock reducibility don't always differentiate between problems in the same way. So we'll now introduce the principle LH, which stands for or limit homogeneous, which says for every two coloring of n squared, an infinite limit homogeneous set has an infinite homogeneous subset. And so an instance of LH includes the color I to which the set is limit homogeneous. Now in reverse math, we often consider the sig zero two bounding principle, B sigma zero two, which just says that bounding holds for sigma zero two formulas. Um, or equivalently, we can think of it as this principal bound star uh, to which it's equivalent over RCA naught, uh, where bound star says that for a simultaneous enumeration of a finite collection of bounded sets, there exists a common bound for the sets. And so over RCA naught, LH is equivalent to bound star, but LH is trivial with respect to y rock reducibility meaning that LH y rock reduces to the identity problem. And this remains the case over RCA naught plus B sigma zero two. However, we have that LH is not generalized y rock reducible over RCA naught to bound star. Um, so this is interesting. And now recall that SRT22 is generalized y rock reducible to D22, in fact, generalized y rock reducible and at most three moves. And this can be proved using LH but because LH is y rock trivial, it doesn't like count in terms of it being y rock reducible in three moves, like it doesn't add to the number of moves. And so because of the use of LH, this leads us to ask whether SRT22 is generalized y rock reducible over RCA naught to D22, and whether LH is generalized y rock reducible over RCA naught to D22. And these questions still remain open. Um, Currently, I've been thinking a lot about what wire rock reducibility over RCA naught looks like um, and just kind of how problems compare in this way as opposed to in terms of just regular wire rock reducibility. And in particular, an interesting phenomenon has been that if you look at the finite parallelization of a problem or of a pi 1 2 problem in terms of wire rock reducibility over RCA naught, things can be quite different than. If just in terms of y rock reducibility, because now you allow for a non standard finite number of instances instead of just a standard finite number of instances. So that's something I've been looking at recently. Um, and yeah, that's concludes my talk. Uh, thank you. Any questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Sarah. Yeah. Any any questions? Uh, anyone? Just feel free to unmute yourself and uh, and uh, go for it. I, I had a question. I probably missed this, but when you play when you set up the definition and you let play play a model, what does it have to be a model of? So it has to be a model of gamma, the like set. Um, Wait, are you talking about the modified game? Well, it, whenever you started the, the, the first, each, any, there were a couple of versions of this where you require, where you allowed a player to play a model, a first order model or a second order model, and then things went on from there. So in any, I didn't notice that, it, it, the, what were there, were there any requirements on what that model was? Yeah, um, so I can go back to that slide. Um, yeah, so it needs to be countable um, in the, in the case of the modified game, it needs to be countable and it needs to be a model of gamma where I guess I should have, I didn't mention this, but typically we'll look at gamma as RCA naught or RCA naught plus B sigma zero two or something like that. And um, for the unmodified game, um, it just needs to be a countable model of first order arithmetic. What does first order arithmetic mean? RCA, what do you mean? Or like, uh, just, just mean like the. No axioms or 
uh, what prompted my question was at one point you said you had to assume that there was a universal sigma zero one formula which follows from RCA naught. So I didn't right. know what you were assuming. Yeah, so we were just trying to make this like as general as possible. So like typically we would look at RCA naught, but in case we might want to make this more general, we noted that you need to assume the existence of a universal sigma zero one formula so that if you weren't uh, if you weren't taking gamma to be RCA naught, like this is what the requirement would be. But you, but you must have been assuming something. The basic axioms of addition multiplication. I mean, I don't know where you're drawing the line. If you're not assuming there's a universal sigma one formula, I don't know what you are assuming. Does that make um, sense? I mean, you, you, commutativity for addition, you know, I don't know anything. Yeah, um, I think we're assuming, um, let's see. So, so Richard, maybe to add, there's a different, we're not assuming anything in the definitions, but in the theorems we make assume assumptions. Yeah, I noticed all the theorems, but. In the definitions, you need make no assumption, it's just a definition. It might be meaningless without that, that, but. It doesn't mean anything, right. Sure, but why not? Why do you have to make assumptions and definitions? Because it just confused me is why not. Because <laughs> it didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> make the I definition, have. right? It's in the theorems that we have to make assumptions. No reason to make them in the definitions. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, or, or... Yeah. Um, so just to get on a kind of the, guideline how to, to, to think about this. What sort of, is the difference between a generalized or a variable reducibility relative to R and relative to RCA um, versus just the standard notion? Does that come from playing some non-standard model and hence sort of now having a lot of now being able to do things that you're allowed to do finitely many times more often? Um, or is there, is there anything else major going yeah. on? No, that's, that's like essentially um, the distinction that, yeah, instead of just needing to look at, at omega, instead of like only having to um, deal with like omega models, we can now, uh, look at any model of RCA naught and uh, the reduction still needs to hold. But, and, but the, the end that you get in the end, that's, that's still just an ordinary standard metric number or? Yes. I need to, some time to, Digest that. Thanks. Okay. So, 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 so this this looks quite quite interesting. I mean, I, I was just going on assuming RCA naught at the bottom, but did you think about assuming putting in stronger axioms? That is, suppose you assume ACA naught instead of RCA naught. I haven't really thought about that yet, but I think, yeah, I think that's definitely like an interesting avenue to consider. Yeah, I think it, it definitely would like to be meaningful would change the principles we were looking at, but yeah, I haven't right. thought about no, that. The examples would be irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, but Uh, any any other questions? Um, a question: um, Is there a relationship between um, winning existence of winning strategies in these games of particular kind to um, um, sequential composition in the Weierach lattice? I'm not sure. Um, 
Yeah, I think it would be, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so I'll say that, uh, yes, I mean, this is more general, right? It sort of allows for any kind of composition, any kind, you know, but yes. You can think like two, I mean, this, even in the original Hirschfeld Jockish game, there is a, the relationship between, say, if you want to, the game can express something like the, the, the star operation under Virac reducibility, which is like a twofold, twofold composition and more generally. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, any, any, any other questions? Anyone? Okay, and this is probably too, too vague to, to be a good question, but I'll better try. Um, for, for the cases where, sort of in the, in the, in the standard barrack, Re reducibility, where we know that there is an a a generalized bar of re reduction, but but no fixed number uh, um, for steps does it? Um, what what is the part that breaks if you would try to gen to 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 move that over to an um, to a reduction relative to RCA. Wait, sorry, can you say that again? Um, take a sort of take two two principles where P is, is generalized value of free, reducible to Q, but not um, with N steps for for, for um, for, for, for all, all, all numbers n, um, okay. is there a sort of quick, simple answer to what will break if you try to write to the power of I say a naught to all of those parts? Okay. Um. Are you asking for like a, a, a heuristic reason why, if if there's no upper bound on the number of steps you need, then why that? Why then you're not provable in RCA not or? Well, I, 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 I no, 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 just means that um, that's just going by the very shape of your theorem. If you would drop, uh, if you would would drop the um, to the power of gamma from it, then it's sort of very easy. We know plenty of counter counter counter. Examples you had them in your talk, so sort of which which part exactly is it that sort of that that breaks if you would try to do that? Do the reductions break? Do the non reductions break? Can it be either way? Okay, um, yeah, I think it can be either way. Okay. Right. Non-reductions can't break, right? Because once you have a counterexample, you have a counterexample. Right. That's true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I think maybe the answer to your question is if your if your problem has a parameter and now the parameter can be non-standard, the world changes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so if there are any other questions? Um, okay, so if not, then uh, thank you very much again, Sarah. Um, and for um, any any folks that may have uh, 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 joined uh, a, a bit late, we had a, since we had such a sort of uh, unusual start today. Um, uh, one quick announcement we made was that uh, there will be another sort of atypical Zoom room uh, next week, 
because it's going to be a talk that's, uh, it'll be a joint talk with, with, with the CIE meeting that's going on at the same time. So um, that'll be done in combination and we'll, we'll send out uh, information about that uh, when, when we have it, but just, just something to, to watch out for.